Hi, good evening, everybody. So we are on to the first lesson, which um, is now from Genesis chapter 3. In earlier part of chapter 3, we find that uh, Adam and Eve fell into the temptation of sin. And so what happened was that they uh, were frightened when God came and they went to hide from God. And finally, they uh, were confronted by God. God asked them what happened. And they said they were frightened and to hide from God. Okay, so this is where we continue from chapter 3, verse 11. The story. All right, three columns. The first column is the story. The second column is the message. What does the story tell? And thirdly, what is the significance? How is it important for us? Okay, so God asked Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? So what can the story tell us? We see that God asks questions. God asks questions for men to answer. Now, for men, as the one at the top of the authority structure in creation, you remember that God made men to rule over the animals. So man is at the top of the authority structure. So man was the first to have to give an account of himself. How did he know he was naked? You see, because in his original innocent state, he would not know that he was naked. Or he had experiential knowledge from eating the fruit and discovering it himself. So God wanted honesty. God wanted truthfulness from the man by asking the question, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? Okay, so what is the significance for us? Well, we can see that God holds each of us accountable. God holds each of us accountable for our own wrong regardless of what others have done. And they will answer to God, just as we will also have to answer to God for ourselves. So we don't have to worry that people are going to escape, inverted commas, responsibility. They have to answer to God, just as we have to answer to God. And this is the first time we find that man had to give an account of himself. He was commissioned to exercise authority over the animals on earth and to be head of the woman in the family unit. Now he had the first, now he had to be the first to give an account of himself to God for what he had done. And we see similarly in the Bible that one day God's servants will also have to give an account also have to give an account of themselves to him. Let's take a quick look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 19. Somebody else can turn to Luke 16, 1 and 2. For us. Starting with Matthew 25, 19. Can you hear? Matthew 25, 19. Yeah, Matthew chapter 25, verse 19. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Thank you. Um, Luke 16, 1 and 2. Luke 16.1, uh, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. But so he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? 
give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Thank you. All right, so we see that in the two stories that Jesus told, the servants will have to give an account of themselves to the master. So this is Adam giving an account of himself at this point in time about the sin that he had committed. We see that God wanted men to give an explanation of how he knew he was naked and experienced fear so that he went to hide from God. Now, this, is a, this was a time of testing. Time of testing for men to be truthful and to get right with God. Take a look at Psalm 51, verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Thank you. That is a, a, trans, a translation. Okay. Uh, the NIV says, surely you desire truth. Max version says honesty in the inner parts. So coming from deep inside us, you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. So God is testing men for truthfulness and to get right with him. And we also see that relationships that have been affected require the ones in the wrong to be courageous, to take the step to repair the breach by being truthful, by being honest. Okay, so it's very important for us to work towards that because that is what God wants, truthfulness, honesty, and integrity. And we will see that God knows us more than we know ourselves. It is our honest relationship with him that we are to truly discover ourselves and learn to become the kind of person we are truly meant to be. Okay, so God asked the man and how did the man respond? The man said, the woman you put here with me she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. The chapter 3, verse 12. And we see that, what does the story show us? The men did not answer God's questions directly. He beat around the bush and he avoided the questions to give a defensive explanation. He gave a defensive explanation for what he had done. In effect, you see his answer indirectly admitted. So he was trying not to take full responsibility. He indirectly admitted that he had eaten from the tree that God had commanded him not to. And the first words out of his mouth were, the woman you put here with me, she gave me. What do we see in this answer? He was trying to deflect. He was trying to deflect the blame. You know, in Malay, we call era. He was trying to era the blame for eating the fruit and try to pinpoint somebody else. And of the three parties here that were involved, he named the woman first. And then after that, God. And then lastly, himself. He is saying, the woman you gave me, she gave me some fruit. So woman, then you, then me. Okay, so it was a defensive reply to try to minimize, try to minimize personal responsibility by using others as the ones to blame. That's, that happens to people like to do or we tend to do okay so now we move on to something that is that is a very significant that is this episode the significance is we see the theme of perspectives 
theme of perspectives. We have come across perspectives before this idea during the, the temptation in the earlier part of this chapter, chapter three, where we saw three perspectives surfacing. The first one was God's divine perspective, where God told uh, men that you are not to eat the fruit or you will surely die. That's God's divine perspective. And the next thing we have is the serpent giving Eve an adversarial perspective, an opposing, an opposing perspective. Oh no, you will not surely die but you will be like God, right? So, so the serpent gave an adversarial an a perspective that is opposing to God. And then thirdly, we find that Eve also had a human perspective. So we have three perspectives during the temptation where Eve's human perspective was she looked at the fruit. Oh, it pleased the eye. Is good for food and is desirable for gaining wisdom. So three perspectives we came across during the temptation. Now this particular confrontation event between God and the man and the woman shows the human perspective, right? And be viewed from different personal perspectives, personal angles and views. We have human perspective, but each person has his own or her own personal angle and view of a matter. So what we see is each individual person can hold his or her own perspective because he or she stands at a different point in time, a different point in space and sees something different from others. What is that? His own angle or his own point of view. Now, each person's perspective or position uh, from where he or she views is right because that is what he or she sees and even experiences from that position or that angle. And so in that sense, what we have is seeing is believing. He or she believes the self to be right. So our human self-esteem will rise to defend ourselves so that we may preserve a personal sense of rightness, which will become self-righteousness. Preserve a self-esteem will preserve a personal sense of rightness and worth. That's what our self-esteem will try to do for us. Personal sense of rightness and worth. Okay, so if you look at the, for example, what I'm holding in front of you, in front of the camera, each person, you will have your perspective. You can see certain things. Right, And if you were sitting around me, somebody would be able to see things from this angle. Somebody might be able to see things from the top. I can see from the back. I can see from the back. So you have your perspective because of where you are at. You're able to see this. And to you, you are correct. All right. But to me, I look from behind. I look from a different angle. And to me, I am correct. Now, who is right? Who is wrong? Who is right and who is wrong? Think about it. Who is right? Who is wrong? What would you say? All is right. Say again. All is right. Everybody is right. Yes. Okay. Any other answer possible? Thank you. Each one have their own view. So who is right? Both. Both are right. Both are right. Any other possible answer?
No other other people want to share something. Okay, all are right from your angle, from your perspective, yeah, from where you look. But what you and I see is only partially correct. What you and I see is only part of the truth, right? Because if you want, you and I want the whole truth, then the whole truth is this thing has got so many different sides. How many sides? For this box, it has six angles. So for us to see the whole complete picture and whole complete truth, then we would have to be able to see all six. It's the same as the story of the six blind men and the elephant. You remember that story? Six blind men came to an elephant and each person was touching one part of the elephant, right? And one man touched the ear and said, oh, elephant is like a fan. Another one touched the tail and said, the elephant is like a rope. Another one touched the, the leg and said, oh, the elephant is like a pillar. Another one touched the body and said, oh, the elephant is like a wall. Now, all six of them are correct from their perspective, but on the overall, their perspective is still incomplete. Correct? On the overall, their perspective is still incomplete because you have to put all six together, the ears, the, the, uh, the legs, the tail, the body, the trunk and so on, you have to put all together to form the true elephant. It's not a wall by itself alone. So this is the thing about human perspective. We all see from different angles and we are correct from our angle, but incomplete. Incomplete. Okay? So we have the man, the man's personal perspective. And he would say it started with the woman. God was the one who gave me the woman. She was the one who gave me the fruits to eat. If it comes down to blame, it was wrong of God. Uh, that means God's fault. Wrong of God to give me the woman. It was the woman who got me to eat the fruit. So you see why God is wrong? If God didn't give me the woman, then the woman wouldn't be here to give me the fruit, and I won't end up eating the fruit. You see, the, the argument is God's fault. Okay? If God didn't give me the woman, there'll be no woman to give me the fruit. I won't be eating the fruit. So you want to blame? Blame first God. You don't blame God? Okay, then second, blame the woman. Because she was the one who gave it to me. I am the last person in the chain of responsibility anyone should blame. So this is the man's angle or way of looking at how he fared in this matter. And in this matter, he was right. He was right. And he could resort to a sense of indignation, no? Not happy, not fair. That I am actually a victim, you know? I am a victim from what God and or what the woman did. So the blame should not be on me. It should, but if you want to blame me, then it, at least the blame should be shared. Okay? Blame should be shared at least. So I don't take full responsibility. So we see when people are in the wrong, there's a tendency to trace their wrong to somebody else. People in the wrong tend to trace their wrong to somebody else who started the whole chain of events. But the purpose is to relegate the blame to the one who started it first and, oh, it's not me. Okay, it's not me. You see that people have the instinctive need to appear or to be free from wrong and blame. We want to look and be all right and good, perfect and blameless. Yeah, we don't want to be the one who is the bad guy. We want to be free from wrong and blame. 
So we will tend to, we we'll tend to trace the wrong to somebody else. And what we see also is each one of us actually is responsible for our own action and decision in doing it. Everyone will be held answerable for their or for our own, our own share of the actions done or undone. So while the man could see a way to deflect responsibility for himself and blame everybody involved, it was not morally right. Okay, so here is one part of the many angles to look at the six sites, if I can use as an example. Okay, if I can use an example of six sites. Morally, it is not right to blame God and to blame the man, uh, blame the woman. We will always have some angle of perspective to blame someone else for the wrong that we do. Now that would mean one of two things if we blame people. First of all, the wrong we do does not matter, but the wrong that others do matters. You can see, huh? if people, if something is wrong, if it's done by somebody else, it matters. It's bad of them. But if it is I that have done the wrong, oh, there's a good reason. That's a good reason. Don't we always see this happening, right? There's a double standard. Or we cannot be blamed for doing the wrong that others caused us to do. No, they make me do one. She asked me to do one. So you want to blame, blame him, la, blame her. La. She asked me to do one. Okay, so we cannot be blamed for doing the wrong that others caused us to do. Don't blame me. She asked me to do one. So this is what or double standard of morality. And the significance is each of us makes our own choice and responds. Okay, instead of uh, applying this very strange kind of morality. Double standard and what? So what we see then is God's response. God's response is to leave alone for now. And then God now wants to hear the woman. Notice once again, I underline the Lord God. Yeah, the Lord God. This is, the Lord God is uh, Adonai, the YHVH that people call Jehovah. So, that is the covenant God. So the covenant God said to the woman, woman's turn, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now God heard the man's answer. Now God wanted to hear what the woman had to say for herself. As man's helper, she was next to be answerable after the man. Each person is answerable for himself or herself. Okay, so this is the woman that must now answer to God. And the significance here is we see God follows the hierarchy of authority that he established to call people to account. And you see the woman's answer, she only realized her deception when the wrong was she only realized the deception when her wrong was committed. You see, it says, the woman, uh, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So he tricked me. It deceived me. She realized the deception when the wrong was committed. And the negative emotions like anger, like guilt surfaced. And things started going wrong. This is the normal order of sin, you see. The normal order of sin is when we do the wrong, guilt surfaces, then we realize we did the wrong, and the guilt and the regret hit home when we have done that wrong. That's the, the order of things that happen. So God wants men to obey him without committing the wrong so that we will not have to experience the after effects of with the accompanying negative emotions, thoughts, and actions. So basically, God wants obedience 
so that we don't have to struggle with all the negative feelings and actions after that. Now, it's often on hindsight. Often, when we look back after the event or after the wrong that we see more clearly what we have done or what has happened to us. So hindsight is actually uh, a little bit too late, but it is the time when we actually take stock and learn our lesson, actually discover the truth. And that is why to God, it is always best that we simply obey best that we simply obey him, regardless whether we know or understand why. Because, you see, he knows best as sovereign God, who knows the whole big picture. God is the one, you know, the six sides that we talk, I talked about just now. God is the one who actually can know all the six sides. Right? God is the one who knows all the six sites. Next week, we will perhaps be able to do an object lesson uh, that gives this a little bit better uh, perspective to it. Okay, so God as the sovereign God is the one who knows all the full picture, all the full details. So he knows the, the complete, absolute truth. He has the complete, absolute truth. And that's why he calls his people to trust. Because we don't. We can only see from the angle that we face, the angle that we come from, the angle where we stand, and the angle that we're involved. We can only see from that point of view. From men's view, we are curious Know, that God commands, we, we think it is best if we know why. Why does God want this? Why does God want that? Why doesn't God want that? That's why we always ask why. And you know, children, they're growing up, they will always ask you why, why, why for everything. Now, simply God's way is for us to trust his word that we must avoid doing something so we will not make the mistake right from the start, even though we might be ignorant. Like children, we don't know. But God wants trust. If we fail, the next best thing that we can do is learn from the experience or mistake and admit the part we have played. Okay, so the woman only realized when the event was over that she had been conned. Yeah? And like the man, she said, somebody made me do it. She said, the serpent made me do it, before she mentioned what she did. She omitted, by the way, huh? she omitted to admit that she ate the fruit because she saw three things that she wanted from it. You see? She, she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate, but she omitted to say that why she ate was because there were three things there were three things that attracted her to eat that fruit. Remember what the three things were? Please the eye, good for food, and good for gaining wisdom. So she focused on the serpent deceiving her, but she did not admit that she had three attractions to that fruit. Like her husband who listened to her, she should not have listened to the serpent either. And that is the fact. So she has a perspective, right? And now she covers part of the perspective by not mentioning what made her eat the fruit besides what the serpent said. So the woman's perspective, personal perspective just now was the man, now was the woman. If the man could push the blame to her and see it from, the, from a certain angle, she too can see it from her own angle, use the same tactic and blame somebody else. She also has her own angle of looking at things. And we all feel it's only fair to highlight the role of the person who told us to do it. Yeah, you want to blame me? Okay, but first you must also blame that person because that person told me to do it. 
The idea to eat the fruit didn't originate with her. From where she stood, uh, her perspective, from where she stood in the event, she could blame her act of eating the fruit on the serpent for tempting her. That's what we tend to do, isn't it? We, we find the person who is responsible for steering us in that direction. So we can justify ourselves by looking for ways out of that situation or responsibility where we may look bad or blameworthy and we don't look right. Both the man and woman were right from their personal angle. But each angle was incomplete and not absolute truth. Okay, each angle was incomplete and not absolute truth. They did not take into account personal action and responsibility. That is another, another side. There's another side of the absolute truth. So you see, absolute truth, there's, there could be a lot of things to consider. There are different sides of different people's perspective, but there's also the perspective where people ignore about what they should be doing or should not be doing. Yeah. See, the fact is God had already told them what not to do. God had already told them not, what not to do. That should be enough for them to be aware and responsible for their action, regardless of temptation or no temptation. So it's a matter of sticking to what is right. Yeah, that's it. A matter of sticking to what is right which they did not do. God's word is not given to us for us to ignore or disregard. Okay? So we may blame others for being the agent to introduce a wrong to us, but the truth is we made a personal choice. Yeah? We made a personal choice for the action that we take. And we did it because we ourselves wanted to. That's the idea of temptation, making us face what we want to or we are not aware of, whether out of curiosity or whether out of greed or other benefit or purpose. And Eve had three reasons. Yeah, pleasing to the eye, good for food and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she had benefits of the purpose. And it could be because we wanted to gain something or we want to make a point and prove that nothing bad will happen to us. Sometimes we, we like to challenge. Sometimes we like to challenge what people say. See, I do it, doesn't happen to me. Nothing bad happens to me. Sometimes we want to prove nothing bad will happen. Now, God sees beyond the words and the external actions into personal responsibility. This is normally seen as the personal motivation. Okay? God sees the personal motivation or even the lack of motivation, which means negligence. And this is Adam's non-action about the woman. Taking the fruit, made worse by his own partaking of the fruit when she gave it to him. So the woman's personal perspective, the serpent tricked her, blamed the one who was not really open and honest. That's not me. It's, I'm the victim, okay? So you see, in sin, they all claim to be the victim. So giving in to temptation can come at a price. Where there's an angle or a cost not previously seen or perceived. That means... We, we give in to the temptation without seeing that there is a cost for it. We have to pay a price with that we did not admit or realize earlier on. So what is the significance? Being the victim, even if we say that we're the victim, right? 
being the victim of a scam or trick did not being victim did not absolve her from responsibility for her own actions and you know you watch crime watch huh? tv crime watch uh, somebody is being some somebody is being a money mule money mule or somebody is doing something that uh, helping to launder money in out of ignorance when the police arrest the mastermind the police also arrest all these people who are ignorant involved in it out of ignorance yeah because their responsibility for their actions the police will still arrest them okay even though so supposedly to them they are the victim so because you see if everybody who does wrong is a victim and every victim is not accountable you know i'm a victim i have i don't have to take responsibility for anything then nobody will or nobody needs to learn to check no need to be responsible to ensure truth and right because as long as we are we are the victim we have no blame everything we do is okay then everybody can cry victim lah. You know, everybody can say, I didn't know, I'm innocent. But that will not absolve from blame. Okay? That will not set us free from blame. A wrong has been done, even if it is done in ignorance. Ignorance is not bliss, right? Wrong has consequences. Even if you are ignorant, the wrong we have done still has consequences. The consequences don't disappear. The consequences don't disappear just because we are ignorant of the wrong we have done. And by consequences, it's both the consequences that happen to us and the consequences of the wrong that we have done, how those consequences affect other people. All right, so consequences both by the doer as well as all the people that are affected, consequences don't disappear. So everyone is responsible for what he or she has done. So simple truth is everyone has the responsibility to know or discover the truth as much as possible and act on it. And that's non-negotiable. Now, the next, whether there is an agent that tempts or induces us to sin, we have to face consequences for our own participation and there's no use laying the blame on the scapegoat and go scot-free for our own actions, right? It is wrong and useless try to find someone to blame for what we ourselves commit. Blaming others is not good for our personal self-esteem. It's a false assurance to self. Okay? And that is self-deception. Blaming others is a false assurance that we are okay when we are actually not. Okay. What happens is we desensitize ourselves to wrong and sin when we blame people. And we need to take responsibility for ourselves. There's another angle. There's another angle from something that we might not see sometimes when we are involved. And the bottom line for the woman is that she knew the truth. The woman actually knew the truth. Okay? Woman actually knew the truth that God had told Adam. So at the end of the day, actually she knew what was to be done and what was not to be done. She chose to listen to another voice that led her astray. So what we can find is God is the only one with an absolute and complete perspective and he alone sees from all angles. 
And God had made man to have a commission. Remember Genesis 1.28? To rule over all of creation. God wants man to rule justly with responsibility, integrity, and obedience according to God's character. So the responses of both the man and the woman, that means mankind, notice so far the Bible did not refer to them by their personal names. The Bible refers to them with the general term man and woman. And it shows uh, the responses of mankind, not just Adam and Eve, but mankind. As we are far from the character of righteous rulers. God wants men to rule justly with responsibility and integrity, and they had a long way to go to be worthy rulers. So what I'm saying here is that we look at all these angles and we look at all the surface realities. Yeah, We are actually looking at all the realities from the surface. Actually, there's something that we don't realize. What is the one important thing we don't realize? See, if you, are look, if you and I have been looking at six sides of this box, what we may not realize is inside the box, there's something else. There you go. There's more truth than just the outside six sides of a box. So truth goes deeper than what we can see. Yeah? Truth goes deeper than what we can see. Let me write that down. Truth goes deeper than what we can see. Like yesterday morning, we were doing the study of 2 Corinthians. We're talking about the principle of giving. So as we ponder on the issue, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, as we ponder on the issue of giving, we look at it beyond the message on the surface to see that it's about love, it's about character. It's about who we are inside. Yeah, so you see, all these things, we may have our perspectives, but they are all very limited. They're all very limited. Truth goes deeper inside than what we can see and argue about on the outside. And that is God. That is about God, the character. Okay, it's about the character of not just individual, but character of righteous rulers. Remember the Genesis 128, they are supposed to rule on God's behalf. Right? right? And so they are supposed to exhibit the character of God. Now, between the two of them, the, the man and the helper, already they are in disagreement. They are already blaming each other or blaming people. Yeah? So how does the character of righteousness come in? Cannot, not possible. So we see blaming is not good for character formation when we are in the position to take personal responsibility for our own actions. Have a thought, right? Blaming is not good for character formation. When we are in that position, the hot seat, to take personal responsibility for our own actions and the era, huh? that's why I said the avoiding that really shows the lack of integrity. It shows a preparedness, shows a preparedness to minimize or evade personal responsibility and then find fault and condemn someone that we feel needs to be exposed and punished. Correct action is for partners, for us to be partners in preventing sin. That's what Adam and Eve should have been, partners in preventing sin. But they were involved in sin and then they started pointing fingers. So one of the most significant flaws we view when people find someone to blame is the lack of deep love. Where Adam and Eve were towards each other. If we love someone deeply, we would not push blame on them. Divine love does not blame. 1 Corinthians 13, 5b to 7, 
Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Blaming Eve as he did shows Adam did not love her deeply enough to take personal responsibility for his own mistakes. Okay, whereas the relationship of Christ and his bride, Christ purifies the church, his bride, by washing her with the word. Right? Christ takes responsibility to purify the church, not to blame the church. Ends the church to purify the church. So we have much to learn about ourselves and about love if we are prepared to pass to blame or to pass blame to someone instead of taking responsibility for our own actions or failures and omissions. Right? Things that we fail to do and then we blame people or things that we do wrong and we blame people. The right action is to be partners in preventing or correcting sin. Preventing and or correcting. So Eve did not love God's truth enough. So that was Adam just now. We looked at Adam. Adam did not love Eve deeply enough. What about Eve? Eve did not love God's truth enough to learn it right and keep to it. She listened to something that appealed to her curiosity her ambition, and her greed. So a lot of food for thought nah, as, we, as we spend the time to slow down and think deeper onto, onto the lessons that we can learn. So you see from this episode, indeed the man and woman gained wisdom from eating the fruit. They're supposed to be wise from eating the fruit, gain wisdom. So from eating the fruit, they knew nakedness was somehow wrong. They knew nakedness was somehow wrong. They also knew how to blame. They also knew how to blame. Blame someone for their sin. So now we have wisdom that they learn. Human wisdom is not necessarily the kind of wisdom that we need, right, to fulfill God's purposes. Human wisdom is not the kind of wisdom that we need to fulfill God's purposes, but our own, but to fulfill our own human wants, our human wants and needs. What about God? God holds each of us accountable for our wrong, regardless of what others have done. Okay. God holds each of us accountable for our own regardless of what others have done. They will answer to God as we also will have to answer to God. So here's the truth. Nobody is going scot-free. As far as God is concerned, nobody goes scot-free. So we don't have to fret and worry ourselves and show how lacking in character we are, how lacking in integrity and responsible we are by being busy to go and blame people. They will have to answer to God for their share of wrong, if they are wrong. Now, if we are wrong to blame them, then that makes things even worse, right? And remember, we don't see all the angles. Remember the box. We don't see all the angles. So we don't see what other people, uh, the angle that people come from. Yeah? Whether it's right or half right or fully right or fully wrong. Uh, we certainly don't see inside the box. So it's important for us to see ourselves and deal with ourselves. Yeah? Blaming someone is just adding another sin or blemish to our character something that we're not supposed to be doing as, as the rulers of God's creation. Okay, so the Lord God 
said to the serpent. Oh, before we go, that is there any any um, any comment or any insight somebody wants to share? Up to this point, any response, comment, or insight to share? So one thing to say before we move on is that these are realities about Adam and Eve. And these are realities about us as people, even today. Because these, this is the genesis, the beginning of many things about us human beings. Perspectives, right? And the way we respond and the truth behind our failures to respond in the right way. Right, whether there's a character, whether there's love, whether there's responsibility, okay, and how we are able to see or fail to see the complete picture uh, that God will see. And so, therefore, the importance for us to be humble in the way we carry ourselves. Yeah, humility, the humble in the way we carry ourselves and not worry about other people's wrong and be so worried and upset. Because at the end of the day, you see that God will address the serpent, God will address Eve, and God will address Adam. Nobody, nobody comes out blameless. God will deal with each person. Nobody escapes responsibility. Okay, so any... any uh, in, insight or comments before we continue? Uh, I have a question to ask. Yes, I'm listening. Go ahead. Uh, I think first, then Daniel. Okay. You, uh, you, you make, you make the, uh, a, a, you mentioned rulers of God's creation. I would think that is applicable to Adam and Eve. Yes, correct. At that time. Right. But for us to assume this rulers of God's creation for today's setting will not be quite applicable. And can I say that? Um, not true, because as, as we see from Revelation, we will see by Revelation uh, chapter 22 that. Uh, the people of God, the servants of God will be, will reign forever and ever. See, what is relevant in Genesis 1.28 to be rulers of creation, okay, in, uh, in the very beginning, will actually be, will actually come around as the conclusion of a long, can I say like a novel, huh? like a storybook we read. If we read the Bible like a storybook, Genesis 1.28 is the purpose of that whole book by the time we come to revelation chapter 22 we see that god's servants will be rulers who will reign forever and ever and what is that righteous rulers of creation but in eternity okay so for us what has happened is there is a distortion because of sin okay there is a distortion because of sin. And besides the distortion, there is also a digression. Oh. Digression meaning we people have lost our way. Okay. We people have lost our way. That's why you see the parables of Jesus just now. Just now the parables of Jesus that we will all have to give accountability. Remember, we have to give an account. Okay. Mm -hmm. So back at the story of the Matthew 25, the accountability is for the servants to rule the number of cities that they will rule when they enter into the master's happiness. Okay, so Jesus even himself also talks about ruling in his parables. So in other words, for us, we are meant to be rulers of creation same as Adam and Eve, and by Revelation 22, it will become reality. 
Okay, at this point of time, if I identify myself to to work towards uh, purity and blamelessness, uh, mm. then th that will help to mold my character. But if I, were to, if I were to fix or have this idea that I, I should assume myself as uh, what God would expect of me, rulers of God's creation, how, how beneficial will it help in my character building? Oh, it's the way you will treat each other. Okay. Character building right. is in the way we treat each other. That's why we talk about body of Christ. You see, there are okay. many pictures in the New Testament about what we should be as a body of Christ. Okay? So all the so this is where all the different angles will come in to contribute to the full formation of the people who will be righteous rulers. Okay? And what sticks everybody together, what bonds everybody together is that divine love. We cannot escape from that divine love of God, which is what ultimately will help us with being uh, rulers of creation that exhibit, just now you said, a righteousness, the purity. Oh, a righteous purity? Purity, yeah. Well, it's a very good answer that you have given me, and at least it helps me to focus better when you talk about this particular aspect. Thank you. You're welcome. To Daniel. Yes, uh, yeah, Daniel. Oh, hi. Okay. Uh, Alfred, uh, just now you mentioned about the uh, uh, love. Huh? You quoted uh, 1 John chapter 5. Um, that is, uh, you were talking about Adam, he should not be blaming Eve if he loved her enough. Huh? That means she, he doesn't have enough love. But 1 John, I think is is. Uh, written more than 2,000 years after it happened in uh, 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 Adam and Eve time. And at the time, I think when he blamed Eve, I believe they were just created not very long. So I, I to, in my mind, I would, I would think, you know, they are like, uh, you know, innocent child. They have not learned how to love each other yet. Yeah, that's why I, 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 I yeah, maybe that's why he, you know, he, he blamed Eve like, for it. I, I, what, what do you think? <laughs> oh, sure. Why not? Uh, yes, we need time to get to, we need to spend time. Uh, we need the time to really develop that relationship and then deepen the love. So yes, you, you are right in that, in that perspective to bring in the angle that they need time. So this is where, as the body of Christ, as individuals, even all of us, we need that time with people. We need the time with our spouses. We need a time with our family members to develop that love. Yeah, you are absolutely right. We need that time to develop that love. So I think that he don't have the time, uh, uh, the luxury of time to love her enough. That's why he blamed her for it. In a way, in a yes. way. So uh, in that sense, you still didn't have I'm that in now, you know? See, Yeah, so I, in that <laughs> So, so men should sense, not be blamed for it, you know? <laughs> sorry, one more time. I, I'm saying, so people who hear it, they may think that I'm siding men. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is, men should not be blamed for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the story goes similarly in the other way around. If did not have uh, enough love for God and God's truth, <laughs> okay, so everybody has some part of a uh, some part of development needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody has de has to develop in areas. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we need time. That's why yeah. we must make that time. If it is that important, we must make that time to develop and to really learn to love. Love, to learn to see that uh, the truth is much. Just now I said, like right, the truth is much deeper. Mm -hmm. The truth is much, much deeper than, than what we see, than what we can see outside. This one. Okay. Truth goes much deeper than what we can see outside. Okay. From our 
personal angle own personal angle yeah thank you for both to both of you for your contribution question as well as insight are we okay we have 10 more minutes. Are we okay? Anything else? Or we, we will go on to uh, God addressing the serpent. Okay, we go on to God addressing the serpent. I think we can just finish that in the 10 minutes. Huh? So we see the Lord God again, Adonai, Jehovah. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Chapter 3, verse 14, 15. So we see that God dealt with all the parties involved. So you see, we don't have to blame people because God will deal with every single party involved, right? Why spend our energy and spoil our own character development by focusing on other people and their wrong? You see, don't focus on people's wrong. Focus on getting ourselves right. And remember, focus on the partnership. Just now I highlighted, that's what uh, Adam and Eve should be doing right? Being partners in correcting or preventing sin. Where did I have that just now? Yeah, be partners in preventing and or correcting sin. That's what we should be doing, not focusing our energies to blame and, and be so upset. So God dealt with all the parties involved in the sin, starting with the initiator. Okay, talking about initiator, can somebody help us to turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 7, where God is concerned, nobody gets away with sin. But as the instrument that initiated sin, the serpent had to bear consequences. So God sees everything. Matthew 18, 7. Matthew 18, verse 7. Woe to the world because of the things that stumble. Such things must come. But woe to the person through whom they come. Mm, thank you. Woe to the person through whom. Things that cause people to sin and stumble. Right? Woe to the person who is the one who caused, who brought in the sin and the stumbling. Right? So you see, as the instrument that initiated sin, the person, or the in this case, the serpent had to bear responsibility. Jesus himself says that woe, woe to the man through whom they come. Such things will come, but let us not be the ones who will start it going. Okay, so that's very important. We must be aware of what role we play in life situations. And so can I just give some suggestion that this kind of thing, our mouth, we have to be very careful with our mouth. Because a lot of people, you know, they are very loose with the mouth making comments, making insinuations, talking about people, yeah? And what happens is when we use our mouth in the wrong way, we make the comments that spark off misunderstanding, that spark off conflict and disagreement, spark off division. We are bringing all these things that cause stumbling blocks. And Jesus says here, woe to the man through whom all these problems come all these sin come. So we have to be really very careful the things we talk about. You know, because the things we talk about are the, a lot of hurting things and a lot of words that we say which 
give rise to misunderstanding because we are not careful how we talk, how we make comments. So better not to make comments than to try to be funny or try to uh, act smart. Right, so what happened is the serpent that deceived Eve was made, was both a physical as well as a supernatural being. Okay, the initiator of sin. What brought the sin in was the serpent. There was a physical aspect to the serpent. There was a supernatural aspect to that serpent. Remember, it could talk. And serpents don't talk. Today, nobody finds a serpent that talks. Yeah, so there was a supernatural part to that, that particular serpent because it was Satan, that ancient serpent that um, Revelation talk about. And you see that unlike Adam and Eve, God did not ask, serpent, what did you do? God did not ask it to give an account because Satan, as well as the serpent, they already, uh, at least Satan knows what will happen. Satan already existed and rebelled against God. He already knew. He already had, he had already been confronted by God, so he knows. Still, God's words show that it, or he, had to be responsible and suffer the consequences. Two parts, huh? Okay, God pronounced a curse on serpents above all land animals. You can say, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. So he pronounced a curse on serpents and it was cursed to crawl on the belly and eat dust. Now, because deception came to the woman in the form of a serpent, you see that she would be at odds with serpents. I will put enmity between you and the woman. So, Beyond that, the offspring of the woman will also be at odds with the offspring of the serpent. Okay, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. So what we can see is bad experiences leave strong memories and scars on us. Yeah, you know, like, like people say, once bitten, twice shy. There's something like that, a little bit like that, once bitten, twice shy. I will put enmity between you and the woman for the bad experience that the woman has with the snakes, okay? There leaves strong memories and even scars. And negative emotions are often attached, yeah, to these experiences, to these experiences, to the, to the people, to the things, and even to the places, right? Correct? Negative emotions we attach to the experience, attach to the people, attach to the things, attach to the place. And they affect the way we relate to them. We don't even want to go near them. We don't even want to talk to them. Or we don't want to go to that kind of place because of bad association. And it is therefore important for us to maintain the kind of attitude that would enable us to apply the kind of responses and emotions to be forgiving and accepting like Jesus with people who may not always interact positively towards us. That's a long sentence. What I'm saying is we have to put a guard on our emotions towards letting all these bad things cause us to be prejudiced, right? Uh, cause us to, okay, I don't want to friend people. Okay, I don't want to do these kind of things because I have bad memories, bad experiences. You know, it, it causes us to pull away from people. So that's, that's where this kind of experience, it form enmity between the woman and the and serpents. Between the woman and the serpent and their offspring. That tells us bad experiences will affect us and it will continue to affect us after that experience. So our relationship with people is the same. When we have bad experience with people, it affects our relationship. See, so it's very important to protect our emotions and our attitudes so that we don't allow 
all these negative things to cause us to, I, I don't want to get along with this kind of people. I don't want to get along with all these, all these people here. You know, that's where people like to end up calling church, uh, churches or Christians hypocrites and so on because of the bad association and the bad experiences attacked. So we have to, uh, we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard. Okay, so like I said just now, there are two dimensions of consequences on the serpent. There is the, there is the physical as well as the spiritual, the natural part. So that translates into the literal curse is the physical slithering movement of the serpent. And that suggests that the serpent was not originally created to slither. And I don't know, I read some, I heard somewhere that uh, scientists have discovered certain marks on the serpent's body to say that it's supposed to be, they used to have legs. <laughs> I don't know whether any of you have come across that, that kind of information uh, that scientists had discovered certain stumps or something, you know, some stumps or something on serpents, on snakes, that they said serpents used to walk, not slither. Okay, so how true that is? Well, here is... Here is where it all started, the Bible, okay? It would slither. Second is the spiritual enmity with the woman's offspring that will lead to the hostility of the serpent, serpent, striking the woman's offspring who will crush the serpent's head. And this is a prophecy addressing Satan as the serpent. All right, it refers to the war between Satan and Jesus that God made the first prediction of the Bible, of the enmity between Satan and Jesus that would lead to Christ's victory. So this is where the story of the Bible begins with how, answering uh, Eileen's question just now, sin has caused us to deviate from the whole commission of righteous rulers. Sin has caused us to deviate. And I give you I give you an, a, 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 little, a little window into that. The consequences between the woman, you know, when God talk about, told the woman that you will desire your husband and he will rule over you. Remember the consequences? God talked to the, to, to the woman. You will desire your husband and he will rule over you. That is an indication of the distortion of ruling. Okay? So that is already a, a little indication that God's original commission was distorted by human sin and human activity. Okay, I can't finish here because uh, we are up to 9.30 already. So let me finish this part next lesson on the uh, enmity, enmity between the woman's offspring and the offspring of the serpent. We will finish that part next week. Okay. Right, shall we pray? Let us pray. Huh? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Once again, we thank you for your goodness and your word to us, that you speak to us of many things that we would have no way of knowing and no possibility of insight, except that you have given us your word. And your word preserved and able us to therefore to spend time thinking, spend time studying, meditating, discussing, and realizing these realities which are relevant to us even today. And so we pray, God, that you will guide us as we continue in our studies, our discussions, and our meditations, that your deeper truth behind the surface message is something that we will understand more truly and we will be able to grasp and then respond in the way that you desire for us to be, to be achievers of that final commission that you have desired for us and which will be accomplished in Revelation 22. We thank you for your love and we thank you, Lord, for your good plans and destiny for us. And we pray that we may persevere and indeed prove to have that character of the servants, 
the servant king that you want us to be. And we pray and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.